Today is Tuesday, October 6th, and I've been spending a lot of time as I'm walking thinking about my son Seville, who is two today, and I hope, Seville, you're having a good time today. I hope you have a little party or something like that. Um, I'm looking forward to being able to see you soon. I started working for Bethany Christian Services in February of 2001 and at that time really knew nothing about adoption and as a, as a result of my exposure to that I really started to feel like God was placing it on my heart that I wanted to be an adoptive mom someday and so I started talking to Brian and, and we really felt like this was something that God was calling us to and Isaac and Cora, the kids who are born to us, have been a neat part of this process. I, I don't think that Cora remembers a day, because she was so young when we got the referral of Seville, I don't think she remembers a day that she didn't know that she had a little brother named Seville who lived in Haiti. God's Littlest Angels is uh, an orphanage in Haiti um, that works with Bethany Christian Services. Started reading their websites and reading the blogs, um, reading more information about this orphanage that had been around for about 15 years run by an American woman uh, and her husband who clearly loved these kids and had a real passion for the children of Haiti. Waiting for Seville to come home was really difficult for us. Um, it was more difficult for Emily, I think, than it was for me, but still, uh, the waiting was just continual. It, it always seemed like we were never getting any closer. Every step in the process took longer than we were expecting. And in some cases, there were more steps thrown into the process than there were to begin with. So we became, at times, really frustrated and really saddened because this little boy who we loved was growing up outside of our family. I'm really glad that the Haitian government required that adoptive families travel to Haiti uh, before the adoption was finalized. In November 2009, we had to travel to Haiti to appear before a judge to sign some paperwork that, it, that said that we'd met our son and that we were going to adopt Seville. So Emily and I hopped on a flight and flew to Haiti for a, a day and a half. So the fact that we were able to go in November, I just cherish that time so much and, and that we got to meet his nanny and get a picture of Seville with his nanny and we got to uh, to see where he lived and see what his sleeping environment was like and see the other kids that he knew and uh, and see what sights he was used to and what sounds he was used to and just get to see him and in, in the environment that was familiar to him was just such a blessing. It was an amazing experience. Um, we're in a country where we don't know the language. We are in a country where we're pretty much the only white people we see. We didn't know where we were going. We were at the mercy of the orphanage's support system and the people that they knew who were there to, to move us and transport us and take us. And, and we spent a lot of time driving and waiting. Um, the roads in Haiti are unlike anything I'd ever experienced. Um, it gave me a lot of appreciation for the Department of Transportation in the US. It was a bit of an overwhelming experience. Um, for those reasons, but more for taking a look at the scenery and seeing how this place was was so ugly and beautiful all at once. People were utterly destitute living in the streets. One of the things that really struck me um, about the Haitian people was how resourceful they were. How they would make what they needed out of whatever they could get. A, a sense of joy that came right from the people who were living in tight quarters, who were happy to be alive, and who were rejoicing in what they had. It's 9.30 or so at night in Haiti. We're in our guest room at GLA. And we woke up this morning sometime just after four o'clock in Miami, and it's been an amazing transformation from there to here. I've been very touched and um, impacted by the fact that the staff, the GLA staff, know who we are. That they know our son really well. Um, that the volunteers know it. That, that they know all the kids by name. I mean, 
but it's like 150 kids between here and the toddler house. And it just blows my mind that they know these kids. And then we come and they're like, oh, you're Seville's parents. Cool, let me tell you about it. Our meeting with Seville was not wonderful. It wasn't magnificent and it wasn't all smiles and hugs and things, but it was real. He was apparently probably pretty tired from a day without a nap. And so his tolerance was pretty low. Um, and it's just been neat. I've been pleasantly surprised at how many people speak English and how easy it's been for us to do what we need to do. Really, it's really special to be here. I'm very thankful for this chance to come to Haiti and to see where our son was born and where he's grown. I look forward to coming back. And I'm really glad that we've been able to be here and um, have some extra time to get acclimated uh, so that when we return to bring our son home, it's, there's more, we can focus more on him. First time I met my son, he didn't really like me very much. <laughs> uh, the first time we met him was right after nap time, when he had not napped. And he was not really keen on the idea of being separated from people that he knew to go with people that he didn't know like any two-year-old would. <laughs> um, so that was that was on, uh, on Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday evening, again, after he'd had dinner and been, been pajamaed, we were given the opportunity to spend some more time with him, take him back up to the, to the balcony where the kids played. And uh, we took him, you know, his nanny got him dressed and handed him to me and I took him upstairs and he proceeded to scream. He was tired. <laughs> um, but one of the things that was most heartwarming for me was to see how the following morning he was well rested, he, he had eaten, and he was very willing to go with us. And by the end of the two hours that we spent with him on the balcony, he wasn't exactly smiling with us, but he had definitely warmed. And that gave my heart a lot of courage and a lot of hope that when we did eventually bring him home, he would eventually warm up. When you adopt a child, everything in their life is completely changed. Everything is different. They have nothing that's the same. They, their food is different, their, the languages that they're hearing is different, the people that they're with is different, everything is different. Uh, the night that we were in Haiti, uh, Tuesday night, Brian had gone up to the nursery after the kids were in bed for the night uh, to record some audio uh, of what it sounds like so that we would be able to uh, play an audio loop and, and put that on for Seville at nighttime. Uh, so Brian went up and spent about two minutes um, standing in the nursery where Seville was sleeping uh, and basically noting what was going on, noting that the kids were getting juice, that the lights were on, that there was a radio playing. Most of the kids were standing up in their cribs and talking um, and, and recording an audio loop of that. We then brought that home, turned that two minutes into 60 and started burning it to CDs. So here we are, Emily and I waiting, expecting that we still have another year to a year and a half to wait. And all of a sudden, the earthquake hits.
Dinner time on January 12th, I get a phone call from my brother saying that there'd been an earthquake in Haiti, 7.2 on the Richter scale. He'd been in a meeting at work and the meeting had been stopped and they spent some time praying uh, and he excused himself to call me. And I was just in shock. You know, we were feeding the family dinner. I didn't even really take the time to think about it. Um, by the time we put Isaac and Cora to bed and scrambled at the computer, um, and started looking looking things up. By the time we'd sort of gotten our feet under us electronically, there'd been a post on uh, the Guys Littlest Angels blog saying that they were okay. Emily and I kept following all the news footage to the best of our abilities. There were so many things to, to read and to listen to and to watch and to learn about things that uh, were just terrifying and were overwhelming and that still really make us sad when we think about the, the destruction and the people who are still there. Probably the biggest difficulty for me was really understanding the scope of what had happened. I think very few people really knew the extent of it for at least a few days. The first thing that went through my mind is, oh my gosh, I hope Seville's safe. I hope the orphanage is safe because we had seen the other kids there and the staff who were there and we were very worried. The orphanage is only about four, maybe five miles away from Port-au-Prince, which is where all the initial media coverage came from. It's the capital city. So when we saw some of the footage from there, from, from Port-au-Prince, we were very concerned. Later on the evening of the 12th, we found out through GLA's website that everybody was safe. They had some bruises. They had a lot of uh, broken dishes and a lot of wrecked nerves, but everybody was safe. That was a huge, a huge, huge thing to discover. We were very thankful for satellite relays and other types of communication because uh, there was no other way to get that information. As the earthquake reached far into the mountains outside Port-au-Prince where an American woman runs an orphanage called God's Littlest Angels, Dixie Bickle felt the massive quake and the aftershocks. She joins us now by phone. Dixie, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. How are you? I'm all right. Tell me how you are and what it was like to, to live through this. Well, we're better this morning. Um, last night was awful. It was um, nothing I've ever experienced before. And um, the whole orphanage swayed back and forth uh, for about 40 seconds, or it seemed like an hour, but it was not that long, they tell me. And... Um, the, uh, lots of things broken and knocked off shelves inside, children knocked down, um, nannies even knocked down, uh, they couldn't stand up, and um, uh, it was, um, it, everybody was shaken up. Luckily nobody was hurt, but everybody was shaken up. Uh, I mean, obviously your first concern when you're in a situation like this, I understand you have 90 children at one location for the orphanage and 70 in another is to get those children out of a building that could collapse. How hard was that? And then where did everybody sleep last night? 
it's impossible to get them out very quickly. They're on the second floor of the orphanage, and um, some of them were on the third floor. So for the 40 seconds that everything was shaking, nobody got out of the building. Immediately afterwards, we got as many kids out as we could quickly. And um, last night, at about 10 o'clock, I had them bring the children back in to the orphanage, but then we had after uh, aftershocks that were every 10 minutes. Um, until almost two o'clock in the morning. No, you also it, have you also have a fourteen year old son who was in school in Port au Prince, had a hard time getting home to you when he did get home. Did he describe the scene in the capital city? He did. Mark um, goes to an American school down in Port au Prince, and um, they did not get home until after ten o'clock last night. They said as they came up um, Delma, which is one of the major roads in Port au Prince that um, there was lots of buildings down completely. They were just flat. There was um, walls knocked down and there was people laying underneath the walls that um, they were sure were dead. And there was even children laying on the sidewalk um, that had died and somebody just laid, left them there. And uh, it was very, um, lots of people in the streets, people afraid to go back into their right. homes. And um, they saw one of the major food markets here um, that was just had collapsed. Um, and at five o'clock is the busiest time of the day here. People are getting off work and stopping at places. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of injuries. Dixie, um, I mentioned you run an orphanage, and so obviously, from your mindset, when you start to hear the early estimates, and they're, and they're, they're all over the place, but that there could be thousands of people who've died as a result of this earthquake, you have to start to worry about the impact on families and children in Haiti. Oh, definitely. Uh, there are going to be more orphans than there already is, and there's a lot of orphans here. There's going to be parents of the children in the orphanage that we never see again and we'll never know for sure if they died in the earthquake or what happened to them. Well, Dixie Bikel, our thoughts are with you and the people of Haiti this morning, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. You're more than welcome. We just hope help arrives to help dig out some of the, um, the buildings so that people that are alive can be saved. Yeah, we do too. Dixie, thanks again. So January 12th, 2010 comes along. The earthquake hits. Emily and I realize that at this point we're still looking at about a year and a half's worth of weight our best estimate because of all the additional requirements that had been added and we're wondering to ourselves does this mean it's going to take longer or does this mean it's going to happen quicker we didn't know but we knew that things were never going to be the same something different was going to have to happen on the 18th of January, we found out that the U.S. government had allowed humanitarian parole for all in-process adoptions in Haiti, allowing the kids who were in Haiti uh, heading to American families to come legally to the United States under a special category of a visa. Wednesday morning, uh, Dixie Bickle went to the American Embassy. And my understanding is she waited until she could get an appointment and had brought all the paperwork for all these 80 kids. And by the grace of God, all of them were granted humanitarian parole visas to enter the U.S. We didn't know what that meant exactly because the Haitian government was completely crippled. They were not responding in any meaningful way to the crisis. They weren't able to care for people. Most of the governmental buildings were destroyed. The judge who approved all of these adoptions was killed. Uh, they were in, in complete shambles. Um, we got the good news about the U.S. allowing the kids to come, but we didn't know if the Haitian government would allow the kids to leave. And we had no idea how they could physically leave, how Seville was going to get from five miles away from the capital down to an airplane and over to the States, or, or how we would ever go and get them. Dixie returned to GLA and obviously shared the news with the staff uh, and they needed to get all these kids ready. They needed to have all their paperwork in order to be able to take it with them. They needed to have food and clothing. They needed to have transportation for the kids to get down to the Port-au-Prince airport, which was no small task. 
um, and they needed to have people to accompany them. Fortunately, there had been about a dozen volunteers who had gone down earlier in the week um, to prepare, to work with GLA and to be there uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the earthquake. And, and many of those volunteers, along with the American members, many of the American members of GLA's staff were the ones who accompanied the kids uh, from the orphanage all the way to the Miami airport. Along the way, there were many, many volunteers who graciously you know, helped out and, and shared their time and their energy and their enthusiasm to allow these kids to be transported. Things were happening very rapidly and we were spending a lot of time, I was spending a lot of time on the phone, on the email, I was very distracted um, and was trying as much as I was able to keep Isaac and Cora informed, to let them know that things were happening. We didn't know what this meant. We weren't sure how soon or even if we would be able to bring Seville home, uh, but we wanted to keep them, try to keep them informed um, so that if something happened suddenly, it wouldn't be quite as much of a shock. January 20th, Wednesday at eight o'clock at night, Isaac and Cora were already in bed. We got an email that said, get to Miami tomorrow. The kids are coming. Thursday morning, when Brian and I were waking up the kids and saying, hi, we're leaving for the airport in three hours, uh, and explaining to them that we were going to bring Seville home, probably within a couple of days, they were both really, really excited. And it was really neat to see, you know, they've both been praying for a year that God would grow Seville strong and healthy and that he would bring him home soon to us. And so it was just really neat for me to be able to share with them, God is answering your prayers. So there we were sharing breakfast and uh, Emily's mom was coming over to take care of the kids for the day. And uh, it was kind of a strange day for all of us. The kids I think were excited, but a little sh in shock. And we didn't know exactly when we were gonna be coming home. So we said, we'll see you in a few days. Of the 150 children at GLA, 80 of them were slated to be adopted by American families. And those 80 were the ones who were on the plane with Seville uh, to come home uh, on January 21st. We were so excited and we had no idea how we were gonna make this work. We knew there were tons of families that were heading to Miami. We knew that we needed to get there and we didn't know exactly what was gonna happen once we got there. Just get to the Miami airport and be there Thursday afternoon. Okay, we can do that. We called airlines, we had some troubles with airline reservations, and we had our tickets canceled, and we had flights booked out from under us, and we were really worried for a while. But we found a great agent on the phone who was able to get us booked on, on the flights that we needed. Uh, we got some amazing support from one of the hotels in Miami who agreed to hold a bunch of rooms for all these families who were coming at, at a really good rate. And then, uh, you know, we went to bed at, I don't know, one or two o'clock in the morning having made all of our preparations and packed our bags and had a real difficult time sleeping. Traveled to Miami, got our flights, everything went fine, no problems along the way. The flights were full, but no big deal. Made it to Miami at around six o'clock at night. We had been told that the flight from Port-au-Prince that would be bringing the kids would be arriving in Miami at 9.40 that evening. So we decided as a group who were all happened to be staying at the, at the hotel that we, that, that we had arranged for, uh, we decided we'd take the shuttle to the hotel, drop our stuff, grab a bite to eat, and come back to the airport to pick up our kids at 9.40 when they land. Didn't work out that way. So here we are in the Miami airport. It's about 6.30 or so on Thursday the 21st, and we're here with five or six other families trying to figure out where we're supposed to be. Changes of plans, moment by moment, hour by hour, and with stretches of cell phone unavailability because we're in the air. But we're here, we're tired, all of us, we're all excited, and we all have no idea what's supposed to happen next. So we're back now in the Miami airport. We went to our hotel and we've come back. 
We've learned, let's see, it's uh, 9.40. We had thought that the airplane would be le would be arriving at this time, but we just learned it hasn't yet yeah. left Port of Prince. It'll be leaving in 10 minutes. Around about uh, 9 o'clock after we came back to the airport, you know, we'd, we'd gone and gotten a bite to eat. Then uh, that's when the, the media started to show up. Uh, news crews with cameras, people with microphones, you know, the Miami Herald reporter with his flip book and his, and his pen and, and, and paper. Um, interested in talking to the parents, trying to find out what their experience was like. Some folks chose to participate, some, some didn't. Um, it, was a, it was a pretty busy time and a very confused time. Uh, we began the adoption process about three years ago uh, with Haiti, and um, it's been a gut-wrenching, grueling process filled with delays, but at the same time a lot of joy has come out of it. And uh, our, our little son that is going to be here in a few hours certainly is, it culminates in that. Uh, when we first heard about the earthquake, of course, our hearts and minds raced to the orphanage and is everybody okay, but thankfully our orphanage director, uh, Dixie Bickle, who does a fantastic job, she um, notified on the internet that everybody was alright and not to worry. And to know that he was there and he was probably scared and we couldn't hold him or comfort him, I was just sobbing. This I have hardly slept this week, I mean, we have cried, it has just been a roller coaster of emotions. We'd be like, he's safe. But he's scared. Now we're not going to get him home. We are going to get him home. The government's going to do this. They're not going to do this. We've got visas, but we don't have a plane. I mean, it's just been just a roller coaster. So until he's in my arms, I'm not going to rest. The flight we were expecting to arrive at 940, in fact, didn't take off until probably closer to 1030 at night. The flight time is about two hours from Port-au-Prince to Miami. So that means the flight didn't land until 1240. But... We never got any of this information except in drips and drabs. It was always the next little tiny bit of information that somebody had gotten from a text message or somebody had gotten from a quick phone call or what have you. It seemed like we were always working from rumor of some sort. Oh, they've got all the kids on the airplane. Well, that's great. Of course it is great, but when you expected them to leave at 940 and you're finding out they're on, or arrive at 940 and they're on the airplane at 10 o'clock, you realize things aren't quite the way you thought they would be. It's my understanding that once the kids arrived in the Miami airport, there was basically an army of support. <laughs> we weren't with them, we couldn't help them, but there were airport security guards, there were volunteers, there were customs and immigration officials, and these people were not only fingerprinting and checking paperwork, but they were changing diapers and feeding goldfish. <laughs> they were carrying the kids from one place to the next uh, and caring for them while the kids were going through this process. Um, when many of the families ended up being matched up with the children, there were volunteers there who said, you know, I've been with your child for the last 12 hours and this is what kind of a day they've had. Uh, and it was just neat to hear those kinds of stories from people who were complete strangers, who were expressing care and concern uh, and sharing their lives to help make the Haiti 80 have a better time of their transition. The kids landed finally at, at 1240 in the morning and then they had to get in through customs and immigration. We didn't know how long that was going to take. They had 83 kids on that airplane who were who were coming in as well as a handful of volunteers and some of the orphanage staff with them. We were in communication with them through you know second and third parties talking on cell phones people trying to peek in through doorways and that kind of a thing but we were completely isolated from them uh, our our group of parents was so we were being sort of spoon-fed information as it became available the night that we spent at the miami international airport was pins and needles pins and needles. Uh, we felt like every moment we might, something might happen. Uh, you know, we had, we, we were looking back, we're like, in hindsight, if we'd known this was going to be this way, we would have brought pillows. Well, actually, in hindsight, if we'd known this was going to be this way, we would have gone home to the hotel and, and slept. Uh, what happened was, you know, every few hours we get an update and it would feel like, based on the update, that the kids might be coming in the next 30 to, to 90 minutes. And so, okay, everybody, you know, stay on your toes and get ready and, and wait. 
And then an hour would go by and we'd get another update that would put us further back than we thought we were before. <laughs> They're just coming home to be with their family now. And that was the joy of it, that we were able to get them out of Haiti because usually it takes two years for an adoption and they were able to go home now. We can provide like um, housing and, um, and love. We love, and give them, we love them and give them attention, but we're not a family. A family provides so much more, and that's what these children need, and that's why it's so important to get them out to their families early. But they, most of them have seen their parents at least one other occasion, and um, it just makes my heart full of joy um, because these kids need a family. So this was January 21st, Thursday. The next day, January 22nd, was Janet's birthday. So they were enjoying this, uh, Bill and Janet, this opportunity to get away and, and spend some, some time, you know, someplace nice for, for Janet's birthday. Well, we completely ruined those plans for them, but uh, we're really glad, and, and I'm sure, I know they are too, that we could be together in that way. But the fact that Janet and Bill were already on vacation within 30 minutes of the Miami airport um, and wanted very much to be a part of the time. Um, it was really an ideal situation. It was an awesome opportunity. I just happened to be down there on vacation and we didn't know what airport he was coming into, but when we found out it was Miami, I was so excited because I thought maybe I could be there for that. And so I got permission from Brian and Emily to be there and I just, wanted to be there because I thought it was just going to be an awesome time seeing them to be united for the first time and also it would be the first time I would ever meet Seville. And when it became clear that it wasn't going to be very shortly, she stuck with us for the long haul. Um, she was a great support, a great friend. Overnight in an airport is something I hope I never do again. The lights are on, it's just like broad daylight inside except there are very few people around. Thank God for Dunkin' Donuts, because it was open 24 hours, and we could get as many donuts and bagels as we wanted. Um, there was no place to sleep or to rest even, except the floor, and the floor was carpeted concrete in some of the best places. So none of us came prepared to spend the night. We were expecting to get our kids late in the evening and then truck them back to the hotel and spend the night there. Worse than that was that the night inched on hour by hour because it seemed like every hour, every 40 minutes, every so long, so often, there was new news of some sort, which really just was more no news, you know, just a little progress at a time. Seville, we're, we're waiting for you. We're so glad that you're able to come so soon to be with us. We all thought it would take much longer than this, and we're glad that it hasn't. And we're glad that you'll be here. Friday morning, around eight o'clock-ish, they said, all right, that's it. Everybody up, we're moving. The kids weren't through customs yet, but they had decided the parents had waited long enough in this one place that it was worth just moving to get a change of scenery. So we took a, probably a quarter mile hike through the airport up to a, a conference room area. These were big rooms with partition walls in between them, kind of like you might see at a either a really depressing business meeting or an especially morbid and depressing banquet. No windows, horrible decor, but enough space to fit 50 families or however many families were there. excitement and anticipation and uh, hoping the kids would arrive soon. They did arrive shortly before 1 a.m. and since then we've just been waiting and waiting and waiting for them to get processed. So what I did was I was able to you know give them an extra hand. I mean for 13 hours it was just a long waiting game but 
but when Seville arrived and they got to be united, I got to be the one to hold the camera and take the pictures and sort of run errands for them and help them spend as much time with him as possible um, and kind of do the legwork or the dirty work. Around 9.30 that morning, they explained the plan. The plan was the parents would stay in this one room, we'd shut the doors to the hallway. The kids would come in, walk past our conference room into an adjacent conference room, stay there, um, and wait for us. Then individually or in small groups, the parents would go and meet their kids. That way there would be a uh, sort of a chance for families to individually connect rather than this sort of mass crazy chaos. So the kids come marching down the hallway and we hear the little feet and we hear some crying, we hear some other things, just, you know, this sort of herd of people moving past. And then they enter the conference room next to us and there's these, you know, the partitions, the dividers. So you can hear lots of things coming through and you hear the noise of the kids, you hear some crying, you hear some singing and comforting going on, you hear all sorts of things. And, you know, the excitement really is building in each of us. We can't wait for what happens next. So the kids move into their room and we hear, after a few minutes, we hear a group of them, probably some of the older kids and maybe some of the, the staff, start singing. And they're singing songs that are a little different to us, things we've not heard before, words we don't know, tunes we don't know. But it was exciting to hear them singing and rejoicing together. It was fun to hear how joyful so many of them sounded. Just after that, the door to the conference room opens and in steps Dixie. Dixie's the director of the orphanage and the room just explodes. People are standing up and shouting and cheering and clapping. We're so excited to see her because she is a sign that everyone is here. All the kids have come home safe and we're gonna get them soon. Once we realized that the kids were being called in alphabetical order by first name and that there weren't very many kids who had names that started after S, uh, we sort of settled in to, to wait and I started trying to mentally prepare myself. I'd read a lot of, a lot of articles and books about the first meeting and how uh, as parents we shouldn't cry even though we were full of emotion uh, and that we needed to be focused on caring for and, and seeking to bond with our child right away. Um, the idea of not crying at that moment was very difficult for me. <laughs> we went, emotions were pretty high. Um, but we worked, I worked really hard to pull it together. It, it appears as though they're calling the kids alphabetically by the first name of the child. And uh, so we're expecting that we'll be close to the end. We're, we're waiting with, with a family who has two children whose names start with O, and they're, they're getting really, really close. The kids are right next door, and they're calling families in by their child's name to go. Destiny and the Air Meet. <laughs> our friends Dirk and Sindra who we went to GLA with in November. Seville! After Seville's name had been called and we left the conference room, we went to meet him. We didn't know where we were going. At this point, the hallway between the parents and the kids conference rooms was a total mess. There were people everywhere, and it was totally crammed full of tables and papers and people, and there happened to be a camera crew in there at one point. And so we, we got called, and we, we sort of walked our way and waded our way out into this mess until we found Seville. And we saw him in the arms of, uh, of Stephanie. Stephanie was one of the... Um, one of the staff people at the orphanage who we'd met in November. And we were so glad, I was so glad, to see that he was in her hands because not only did he know her, but we knew her. When we actually finally came out to the hallway uh, and were joined with him, um, I was surprised at how abruptly things happened. You know, we, we were scanning the crowd looking for him, hoping we'd recognize him, grateful when we finally did. Uh, saw him in the arms of someone that we knew, which was great. 
um, but really didn't have a chance to chat with her much about what his trip had been like or get many details. We took him and started giving him Cheerios and water and, um, and just sort of trying to focus on talking to him softly and being friendly and nice and not crying. And uh, in the midst of a chaotic room, it was quite a challenge, but he seemed to do just fine. When we met him, we were exhausted, and so was he. So we sat right down there in the hallway, right on the floor, and fed him some Cheerios. <laughs> and he went right to it. He, uh, I don't know, he must have ate a half a cup of Cheerios in about 10 minutes sitting in that hallway. What, uh, what everybody was doing was pretty, was the impossible. It was a dream for most parents, and uh, the dream became realized today, so it's very exciting. Um, and uh, what the U.S. government did to get these kids home to their forever families is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. These aren't newly adopted children. They're children that, uh, for us, he was, he's been our son since October of 2008, and we just had to go through the paperwork to, to make it realized. So. Oh, we're so happy. We're, we're It's amazing. It's yeah, a miracle. It is amazing. It is amazing. It's, it's, can't even put it into words how happy we are. So sad what it took to bring him home, but mm -hmm. such a miracle. It's hard for us to say goodbye to them all, but sometimes it's it's good to say goodbye because you know they're going to a, to a really nice house, a really nice family. But um, it's it's hard when you become so attached to them. 10.30 in the morning, Friday, January 22nd is when we finally got Sibyl. From the first minute, he was munching Cheerios, and 10 minutes after that, he was asleep on Emily's lap. We had a two o'clock flight out of Miami, flew to JFK, and then flew home to Rochester. Finally got to our house at 10.30 at night on Friday evening. That 12 hour stretch, Sayville did nothing but eat and sleep, which was actually kind of good for traveling. Being there has had this effect on me where I just feel really close to Seville, and I feel like I have this special connection with him. And, um, you know, it, it's just really kind of tuned me in more than I think it would have had I not been there to, you know, what he's going through, um, you know, what a huge journey this was for a little guy. And, you know, the process he's going through to make his adjustment, it just really connected my heart to him and, um, you know, everything he's going through. I found out that, you know, Brian and Emily were matched up with Seville on my birthday last year, 2009, and then, um, we got to the airport, expected him to arrive the day before my birthday, 2010, but it took so long, he didn't get here till my birthday. They didn't get connected to him till on my birthday. So again, I feel like that's been a special gift to me from God that it's just a really, just a really neat uh, memory I'll have every year for him. She was a great support, a great friend, um, and a great help when it came to some of the logistics after receiving Seville. And one of the things that's neatest to me about this is that her having been there has created such a neat bond, um, both between us and, and Janet and having shared that experience, but also between Seville and Aunt Janet and, and the connection that, the special place that, um, that Aunt Janet now has in her heart for her littlest nephew. Seville, I want to be your favorite aunt and I love you very much and I hope you never forget that and I know I never will. We got home about 10.30 on Friday night, the 22nd, uh, from 12 hours of traveling with a little boy who was such a trooper, um, who did great on the plane um, and in the car. We were nervous about his first car ride in the car seat, and he did fine, looked out the window, uh, but, but did absolutely fine um, in the cold Rochester weather, which he'd never experienced before. Uh, we got him home. And we're basically going to fall into bed. Um, everybody else in the house is already asleep. So we got home and uh, set him down on the floor so that we could get dressed for bed and we'd get him into some, some pajamas. He proceeds to stand up and walk down the hallway. <laughs> he didn't know he was walking. Um, it's, it's a great, 
great miracle to see that, um, to see that he was walking uh, and, that, and that the first time we saw him do that was in our own home. I think that during that time he was basically in survival mode. You know, he'd had a, a really difficult couple of days with all the, the earthquake and the aftershocks and everybody around him, I think, had experienced a lot of a lot of distress and panic and fear. I think he was feeling that, just as, as kids can sense that in, in the people that are around them. Plus, the travel was brutal. The overnight that they spent somewhere in customs, probably. Um, the differences in food and people, the emotional strain. For about the first two days or so, two or three days, he really was very compliant. He was a, a joy to be with. He slept a ton. He ate everything we put in front of him. Uh, he was basically in survival mode, just working his way through, making sure he all of his basic needs were met. After his survival mode period, um, you know, two or three days after we had met him, he really started to come alive. We really started to see the joy of of his delight in music, the uh, fun that he had in playing. He really enjoyed Isaac and Cora a lot. And we started to see that come alive in, in his face. He also started to tell us about the things that he didn't like so much, the foods that he wasn't interested in, or he just started to develop emotionally. And we really started to feel like there's a little boy in here who who has a heart and who is, who's our son. I can't tell you how happy I am to have Sebo with us finally. We, it, it's kind of sudden. Here it is, a year later, and it's a sudden thing that he came to be with us. We're, um, we're just honored, really honored that he's a part of our life. We feel like God has done a miracle in bringing him to us and we we can't wait to see what's next for him and, and for us for our family together i'm just reminded of god's sovereignty and how in the midst of this unimaginable tragedy um, god did this amazing miracle and brought not only our son but more than 600 other orphans home to their adoptive families faster than expected. We give him the glory. <laughs>